Okay, I think we're live. And uh, two hours earlier than what I <laughs> I uh, told people, but that's okay. I was hoping to get some viewers to come in and, and uh, see what we were talking about again. But um, it'll it'll show up, you know, as a recording. Okay, we have one viewer now. Now let me go and see if they can hear us and if they can see my screen when I share it. That's the important thing. Yeah, I got the chat up. I don't see anything in there yet. All right. Oh, so you, you have the chat up. That's good. Hopefully, I was going to try to have someone monitor that for us today, but uh, that, that didn't happen. What am I trying to do here? I want to go to... Well, there's one viewer that can hear us. Okay, we're getting a thumbs up there. Yeah, Laser Floyd. Good to have you. Um, let's see. Okay, we're going to th turn off the sound there. Now, now I will go ahead and uh, share my screen and make sure it shows up. Because the trouble was, I went like this. I said, share screen. And then I said, present to everyone. And that meant you could see it, but, but the viewers could not. So do you see this showing up now? Uh, yeah, I see it uh, showing up on uh, my phone. Where I got the live or the chat up. Excellent. So, all right, we've got people here. Uh, so let me, uh, I'll get it started by saying, hey, Chris and I met last night. It was impromptu. We didn't anticipate going live, but we went ahead and did that. And we went over a lot of material, lots of information. And, uh, but my screen was not sharing and I'm a little uh, inexperienced at doing these. And so I, I didn't go and look in the chat, people were telling me, hey, we don't see your screen. But our conversation is recorded. And I was thinking about maybe going back and uh, maybe playing that and do a video edit and maybe show what I was talking about uh, on my screen. But that would be a lot of work. Well, I think our conversation last night, let's see, someone's uh, chiming me here. Hold on one second. Um, our, our conversation last night was a good start. And what I thought to do was open some tabs. I've got quite a number of them open that are all based on our conversation last night. Uh, I was kind of groping for and looking for things to present and, and explain some of the things Chris was asking me. So I, uh, I have tabs open that we can use. We don't need to go through all of them, but I wanted to at least have some uh, some imagery, some graphics, or some some uh, things that we can look at to uh, to use for the conversation. And if you don't mind, Chris, I'm going to just ask you again because maybe this will be the real one that <laughs> we'll keep up up there for people to refer to. Um, people are real interested in your background. Um, here's a picture of us last night talking. This is at about the. You know, it was good. You had you had good material up here on the back on here that we were referring to. If we could just start this uh, hangout now with you going over again your background, uh, working for the DOT in Missouri and so forth, and and put the years in there. I think you said eighty three or so. T uh, why don't you go ahead and take it away? Okay. And FYI, uh, you probably don't want to show the Google Hangout link. Oh, did I already do that? I believe so. All right. I saw it in the chat. Someone put it in the chat? Yeah. So what happens is people can come in. What happens? Uh, yeah, I think they can come in if they got the link. All right. But uh, I'll start off with my experience. Uh, in 83, I was hired by the Missouri, and, uh, Missouri Highway and Transportation Department and had uh, no experience in surveying. So I started out, uh, my very first job was 
got props today. This is a hand level. And if you look through this hand level, it's got a level bubble that moves up and down like this. Well, my very first job was is to make sure we used a 100 foot steel chain to make sure that that chain was level when we were making our me measurements. Then from there, I moved up to rear chainman, lead chainman, and then eventually instrument person. And uh, was with the highway department for uh, 12 and a half years, up until around 96. And then I moved back here to Colorado, where I was born and raised, and started working for a uh, land, small land surveying company for about, oh, I think six or seven years till he passed away. And the company that bought his equipment and his records from him hired me immediately and I worked for them for a couple years and then uh, worked for one other uh, small surveying company for four or five years. And uh, then my friend that I met out in Kansas City moved out here and started his own business. And I've been working for him for, oh, probably nine or 10 years now. Okay. Yeah, that's going to keep happening. Um, then, uh, as we were discussing last night, it was about, what, four years ago, you had this came to the conclusion that the earth is flat even with all of your experience as a surveyor, you're, you are a surveyor with a, a career like you just described, and you've come to the conclusion the earth is flat. Do you want to talk about that? Oh, how I come to that conclusion? Yeah. Well, like I was saying uh, last night, I uh, was uh, on the internet looking around and seeing flat earth on there, and back then there wasn't very much material at all so some of the stuff i come across uh took me toward the hollow earth theory and i thought that was pretty strange kind of turned me off a little bit and then after thinking about it for two or three days all the bells and whistles started going off first thing i thought about was differential leveling and now what about what about differential leveling um has you thinking the earth is flat because the different uh, the level has no curvature correction in it. You sure about that? Yes. Okay, I'm going to show you that, that isn't the case, but you're actually leveling along a curved reference. I think that's one of the things that you, like other flat earthers, confuse flat with level. Do you, do you realize there is a difference? Well, I'll agree to disagree. Uh, well, I mean, we're here to talk about it. How How is it that flat and level, are, are they one and the same thing? In my opinion, yes, they are. Okay. Well, uh, that's okay. So we've covered the, your background and then how you have arrived to think the earth is flat. I want to go through, I'll go, I'll just introduce all these tabs. And then once I'm done with that, you can pick up any where, you know, anywhere you want on any of these that interest you. Uh, one of the things I want to get into during this hangout is a discussion on uh, state and country borders and how these, these are actually laid out and uh, surveyed for many, many thousands of miles. This is just one picture I have uh, posted up on my Flat Earth Cant Geodesy group. Um, this, maybe we could talk about this in a minute, in a little bit. Um, we last night talked about, uh, do people still see my screen, by the way? Uh, I can see it on my phone. Okay, good. So we're still... So things are still working. Um, I brought up, I just did some searching on some of the terms and some of the topics we were discussing last night. Uh, map projections, I just searched on map projections explained. And for anyone watching this that is interested in the uh, things that Chris and I are going to be talking about through this hangout, you can always drop back and 
do some of this uh, research yourself. This is practically going to be almost like a, a little curriculum on introduction to surveying and mapping. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm looking at map projections explained. You can get to a lot of this information just by scrolling through and clicking on these images, which will take you to those websites just to give you the basic understanding of how, how many map projections there are, uh, how, it's, how it's accomplished mathematically. And uh, also, of course, you just go like this and come right to the articles. And also, there's probably tons of vi videos on this topic. So that's one tab. The next one, uh, leveling, we'll, we should talk about that because as Chris just said, he believes that flat and level are identical. Um, and I, I would tell you, well, they're absolutely not. Um, and you know what? You said that. You, what you said was that each, you know, each person is entitled to their opinion. And for all those watching now or who will tune into this later, you know, you can come and look at this information. Uh, I can't claim to be uh, an absolute expert in everything. So there may be things in here that me or Chris are not aware of. So you may come across some information that that uh, fills a, not, uh, a gap in your own knowledge. So you can look up sur survey leveling. Yeah, let me step in for a second, and I'll say the same thing. I do not claim to be an expert on any of this. Yeah. And there's there's people that's been in the surveying field for 50 years, and they'll tell you they just have skimmed the surface of a yeah. lot of what we're going to talk about. Yeah, I think uh, some people... Uh, delve in deep and uh, get PhDs and, and and learn a lot in a short amount of time. Um, I'm uh, not one of those people personally. <laughs> so, so I've got a, a leveling up here. Uh, we talked somewhat about dynamic height last night. This is the thing that I, I hope uh, you will start to look into, Chris, that while you described and do use uh, serving equipment, uh, proficiently as an operator, I think uh, some of the information I'm going to show you here is probably not something you are familiar with or, uh, or uh, you know, experienced with. Here's an example that is a measurable thing that you can find for yourself. Uh, and that is that the delta height, when you, when you add all of these heights together through leveling, the, the, the difference in height at A to C is not going to equal the difference in height from, uh, from B to C. And that's because when you're leveling, and especially going up in through terrain and, and going through uh, uh, elevation differences of great ones or orthometric height or uh, greater altitudes, you are going through different gravity potentials, and it's measurable, okay? So I just wanted to show that. We can drop back to that and talk about it. Yeah, talk, those talk, are also explained as equal potential surfaces, correct? That is correct. And they, as you see, they are not parallel. And this is an exaggerated sketch, but it is a measurable thing. It is, it is not a made-up um, math model. It is an, literally can be measured consistently. Um, we talked somewhat about GPS yesterday, uh, so I just said GPS explained. There's a, uh, a bunch of there, and there's some images we can drop back to. And these were some of the things I was pointing at on my screen last night, and obviously no one saw what I was talking about. Um, I also wanted to make you aware of, if you haven't watched it, the video that I did on GPS, and at about this minute, here in the uh, in the presentation or in this video, I talk about Rhinex. You and I talked about Rhinex uh, last night. The Rhinex file to me is the uh, is the uh, open source uh, telling of what's going on in GPS. Because when you examine those files and learn uh, what is contained in those files, anybody with a text reader 
here, I want to show you this. And, and with an understanding of what these numbers are, you will find out that in the navigation message that GPS receivers are recording, uh, it tells you where the transmitter is located. And it's and these transmitters are located approximately 12,000 12, miles above the earth. And that is how those intersections are done. So just want to talk about that briefly. The next thing was, uh, like I said, I wanted to get into discussing some boundary issues because you do have the experience as a, a boundary surveyor who is breaking down sections. And so how, you know, how is that done? Of course, there are, you know, many thousands of survey markers. These are just ones marking out state and country uh, boundaries. And have you ever been to this one? I, I've never been there, but you're out west. Maybe you've stood on stood on four states. Have you been there? To the four corners? No. Okay. I've done a survey along the Utah-Colorado border. Okay. So that's an interesting spot where four states come together. Um, so it's a real location. It has a real position, latitude and longitude. And it, and it goes back to what I was talking about here. These lines have all been run literally by surveyors and all these points are marked. I, I bring this up to here, you know, when we drop back to this, I want to hear you kind of reconcile your flat earth belief with the, with this, uh, you know, I, I just shake my head. I don't, you know, I'm actually, <laughs> I have to tell you, when I heard you discussing how, what you know about surveying, I'm, you know, like, I'm trying to get my head wrapped around that. And you also believe that the earth is flat. So I don't think I've fully absorbed that yet. So I don't know how you reconcile this with a flat earth, but uh, well, it'll be there. I mean, if you want to get into that, let's see where else I'm going with this. So the BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, the uh, pr principal meridians and how the sectionalized lands uh, were laid out and that these points are marked these meridians, these uh, true north-south lines have been run. You have experience with that. I, I, you know, maybe we can get into some of that. Um, the solar transit, are you familiar with this instrument, Chris? No, I haven't used, I haven't ever done any uh, solar observations in the field. Okay, well, no, I've done solar observations, but that that's not what this is. Uh, you're, you're, I think you're thinking of, doing astronomic observations to determine azimuth using right. either Polaris or the sun. Actually, that's not what this is. This is something different. It's called a solar compass attachment that was used to, uh, to stay on the true meridian when the Bureau of Land Management surveyors laid out the sectionalized lands. And that's how you get uh, the, you know, that's how you get these meridians run. Um, this might be a good, I have this open in Google Earth, but, you know, you do realize that the distance from here to here is longer than the distance from here to here, and that's because these meridians are converging, right? So there's, uh, you know, some BLM topic we can get into, the solar compass. I, I mentioned uh, this book to everyone. I, I like this book because it's short, easy to read. Uh, certainly you can delve into this in much greater detail in, in a lot of other books. Uh, the, the interest I have in, on this particular page, page 47, is the, uh, the boundary line between uh, Maryland and uh, Delaware. Um, and this all has to do with uh, measuring latitude. So while they used these instruments for running the meridian lines, the uh, latitudes were also observed by astronomic means, either at Polaris or sun at local noon. And <clears throat> I'll just jump over to Google Earth real quick. You know, I'm kind of working on planning this expedition for me to go have a little fun uh, kind of replicating this. So. Again, the, you know, these lines really do exist. These markers exist. Um, the difference in latitude is, is real. <laughs> it is measurable. And uh, 
Now I'd like to get into that too and see how you reconcile the surveying that you're doing as far as breaking down sections and using the, the BLM instruction manual. I think I have that open. Now here, uh, measuring latitude activity. If anybody looks this up, you can find out how you, you can do this yourself with just very simple uh, protractors and a, and a weighted uh, string. And that's the tie-in here is, uh, again, how, how these lines were established. You can you could do this for yourself. And I think, you know, here's, here's one right here. You just take a straw. You can actually print out this car on some cardboard or a piece of uh, paper and tape it to some cardboard. And then you wash her in a string and you're able to measure the altitude to uh, Polaris and, uh, you know, determine your own latitude. And that is uh, a lot of what is discussed in this book, A History of the Determination of the Figure of the Earth from Arc Measurements. This book's filled with stories of how they measured their, their latitude uh, over and over again uh, for the purpose of determining the distance between uh, a degree of latitude. Uh, the next thing I looked up and have a tab open is just discussing land surveying accuracy standards, positional tolerance, uh, specifications. I bring this up in reference to the test you're doing. And I think we got into this a little bit last night in our conversation was, you know, to what accuracy specification are you going to be doing your test? And um, so this is a, a, a very interesting topic of determining the uncertainty of your measurements and what it takes to achieve a certain order of accuracy, which you should probably define for your test. This is a state plane coordinates explained. We, we talked about state plane coordinates last night. Um, and you had an example of uh, the cord distance on a line 10 miles long being very close to the actual arc distance. And uh, I was, you know, I'd never really thought of it that way or looked at that. So I thought, well, I don't, I don't think that that was part of their consideration when they developed the state plane coordinate system. But then I thought today, I thought, well, you know, who's talking about 10 miles? We're talking about states that are, you know, 400 and some miles across or, or thereabouts. So these state plane coordinate systems were developed to accommodate much larger, uh, let me get this off of here. Turn on the state plane coordinate thing here. You know, these zones break up the states and the states are a lot larger than 10 miles. So I think the cord distance that you, you know, that example you used of a cord distance compared to the arc distance across the uh, curve is much larger than a hundredth of a foot. Uh, uh, keeping with the idea of, of, of choosing a accuracy specification to, uh, to achieve for your test so that you know that what you're setting out to do is exactly what you've achieved, you know, in repeating yourself, you can go and look up the DOTs. I looked up the DOT in Missouri. They don't really specify things, but they point to the Missouri uh, Department of Agriculture website, and they have this land survey program, and much of this is spelled out in, in this uh, website that you can come to. Uh, and here's the, uh, here's again, talking about uh, orders of accuracy for horizontal and vertical control. You, you want to define that so that when you're done, you know you've achieved it. Turns out that Missouri has a VRS system. These are continually operating reference stations. And uh, where you live, Colorado, you can go ahead and download the same thing. They have their own standards and specifications. I just grabbed chapter two of their survey manual and it does go into 
uh, much of what I'm uh, laying out right now. This I'm just throwing in because I want people to be aware of George Hat Hatnick and what he's doing. This was done a few days ago. People should come to his channel. He's doing a lot of work right now up on a frozen lake where he's using the water surface as his reference. So um, just a shout out to George on this live stream. Here's uh, the, oh, by the way, Utah has a VRS. You, and I think it's a free subscription, Chris. You can uh, get a uh, login and, and make use of it out here. That's now, I, yeah, go ahead. That's, 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 that's real handy. Handy. Yeah. Now, I, um, I also downloaded some topographic maps of the area you're working in. Here, it seems like they didn't even have a roadway yet. This is an old map. Pretty old. This is from 1954. And here's a newer one. This is from 91. And I think this is the area where you're you're working. It, does this fill with water uh, at times? Is there water there when you're working? Uh, I think when you get out uh, pretty close to the first bend out there. Yeah. Headed out to Antelope Island. Okay. Then the water starts from there and heads out to Antelope Island. But if you go back from there, it's pretty dry, muddy. Okay. Well, I, I downloaded these and I, I'll send them to you there. What interests me is that how you reconcile these latitudes and longitudes with flat earth and how you reconcile the laying out and the breaking down of us, uh, of townships and sections um, all based on, on geodetic surveying on the, the latitude and longitude system. Uh, and that would be in reference to the lines converging going toward the north. Yeah. I think the Gleason's map is a good example of how that would work on a flat earth. All right, well, yeah. Also have converging lines going to the north. Yeah, I mean, it's a real thing, right? It actually does do that. Yes. And here's the BLM Manual of Survey Instructions. Anybody can grab this, take a look at it. Uh, it's a real book that has all the instructions on how to uh, break down these section corners and how the error gets thrown into the, the last section, usually up in the upper left, I believe. But I, I do have to say, I'm not... I survey in the east and we're over here in the meets and bounds states. So I don't have any any career experience working here, but uh, I have some familiarity with it just based on, uh, you know, knowing other surveyors that work out here. So, but you can come and get, get that manual. You can literally download that PDF. Um, I wanted to ask you, if you've seen these pictures that I've taken, have you ever seen these pictures? That's the Empire State Building. No. All right. Well, this is the Empire State Building taken from about, uh, I think it's about 40 some miles away. And I'm on a, uh, a lighthouse. So the elevation of the crosshair is 160 feet. Okay where I am. And of course, the Empire State Building is uh, a whole lot taller than uh, 160 feet. Just, uh, I wanted to bring that to your attention. You should, you could probably come to my WordPress site and look at some of the work I've been doing. How, you know, how do you reconcile this with Flat Earth? Perspective. And how, how does that work? Things shrink off in the distance. They shrink. Do they shrink or do they just look smaller? Well, they are, their appearance is smaller. That's due to perspective as it gets further away from you. Yeah, and that's what we're and seeing the, here. That's the, same, what we're, the same if you had a bunch of poles all uh, stacked together that were five feet tall looking off into the distance. By the time you look at the last one, it's going to look much smaller in perspective to where you're at because everything converges to your eye to your eye level. 
Okay, I mean, I've, I've, heard, I've heard these things before, but uh, again, it, it appears smaller, but it isn't smaller, okay? The Empire State Building is still the same size, even though 41 miles away, you know, it looks smaller, but it, it hasn't shrunken. You know? So, you know, the Empire State Building is actually a uh, triangulation station. It's been observed and is plotted on triangulation maps by observing it from far away. You know what I mean? Like, in other words, when you observe it, you can still locate it, right? Right. So how do you reconcile our ability to locate the Empire State Building by triangulation, similar to what I'm doing here? But what's how is perspective preventing me from making that measurement? I mean, is the, is the Empire State Building where we think it is? Yes, and you're talking about horizontal triangulation. Yeah, but with, in triangulation, they measure the zenith angles also for the elevations. I mean, like, you know how they determine the elevations of mountains? Through triangulation? Yeah. No, I'm not uh, arguing that you can get a good horizontal location through triangulation. Oh, but, yeah, but we can measure the height as well. Yeah. The elevation. I won't. Uh, yeah, I don't dispute that either. All right. So then perspective is not something that would prevent me from being able to determine the position of, of something off in the distance using surveying equipment, right? Right. Okay. So here... The uh, Empire State Building is, uh, I don't know, what is it? So, well, it's well over a thousand feet tall, but uh, my crosshair at elevation 160 is striking near, near the top. If the earth were flat, this crosshair should be down here. Just saying. The other thing I did while I was up there on that lighthouse was measured zenith angles to the water uh, you know, if you uh, if you turn around and look back this way, you're actually looking at the ocean. So I have zenith angle measurements to the water surface, to the horizon, and I also have them from the ground level. So I've measured the zenith angle to the water surface at, at near ground, and that's exactly one of the ways um, – the size of the earth was was determined. Um, and here's one where the horizontal crosshair is set just level. And this uh, flat earth precept that gets preached so often that the horizon always rises to your eye level doesn't seem to hold true, does it? Under magnification, that wouldn't be true. Magnification, what do you mean? You're looking through the telescope that's magnifying what you're seeing out in the distance, aren't you? And it's it's focuses to infinity. Well, this is a fixed focus. I mean, there's no zoom capability on here. It's just right. set. Yeah. But it is magnified. Well, you know that hand level you were talking about at the beginning? Yes. You could do the same thing with that. You could go to the ocean and you use that hand level just to use your eyeballs so that you can determine this horizontal reference. And that is the thing that's missing on so many flat earth videos talking about how far away they can see off in the distance. Um, they never do establish that horizontal reference. So I don't, I don't see where this telescope is having it has any effect on where that horizon's located. It's probably looking right at the horizon line, but with mirroring and distortion, you get the water line that appears to be lower than the crosshair of your transit. Well, how do you overcome that? I mean, I don't agree with what you just said, but how would how does that work? Like I said, you could take that hand level you have, 
that you used when you used to keep the tape level, you could stand here right next to the theodolite and create this same thing. You could do the same thing. And there's no magnification at all. Well, what I'm saying is, is there's a band of mirroring that goes on between your above your crosshair and below your crosshair. So your crosshair is probably looking at the true horizon, but with mirroring and uh, distortion, you get your uh, what you what the water appears to be at the horizon is not the actual horizon. Okay. Well, like you said before, we just have different opinions. I don't see any distortion, and I don't see any mirroring, so I don't even know what where how that factors into this particular picture. Well, I'll, I'll have to send you a few videos on that, and then I'll jump in here, and, well, maybe you can do it. Well, I've got just one more. I've got two, well, two more tabs, and then, then, like I said, anything that sparked your interest that we could go over, I'd like to do with you. This is the same idea. This is a picture of Philadelphia um, taken from the top of a fire tower called uh, Apple Pie Hill Fire Tower. Um, it's closer. This is only 30 some miles, 32 miles. The elevation of the crosshair is 256. And I, I'm just kind of uh, maybe 100 or so feet below the Comcast Center, which is a, over 1,000 feet tall. The only distortion I see here is some haze. And, I'm t and what I'm s telling you is that if the earth is flat, that crosshair, you know, belongs down here. The, th uh, the same thing happened at, uh, let me see here. This is what, this is the last thing I did when I went down to meet Soundly. And I, I included both of these pictures in this presentation, but this is going to discuss the work we did to locate the uh, Marriott building. So this is the triangulation of observations of the building itself close up. And then here's the building from across the lake the telescope set at 90, you know, level. Um, it's a pretty clear shot. It's getting to be dusk. And again, you know, that's almost like a repeat of what I did there in, in Philly, you know, looking at Philadelphia. So, I mean, and it, again, I'm trying to talk with you, and, and I hope we get to do that in this Hangout. The, uh, the rec to reconcile these maps that we make using surveying measurements, all right, like this triangulation diagram. I'm flipping all around here. This is the old triangulation diagram showing the points that they established to, uh, to build that causeway there. I know, and so when you talk about distortion, magnification, mirroring, and so forth, how do those affect surveying measurements? I mean, in other words, you know, are, are these things where we think they are located? Well, most of the surveying measurements are made uh, not much over a mile, correct? Or not? Oh, no, these triangula that triangulation diagram is, uh, these are much farther than a mile. What they use? The satellite. And how far are those observations? Oh, you can, you can, here, let's go back to this tab. I'll show you what their, what their limitations are set to. You could use this same um, reference for the test that you're going to be doing. This includes um, this includes triangulation, and it also includes leveling. So that's the work you're doing now. 
and uh, it does talk about uh, station spacing, talks about uh, site lengths. So all the triangulation diagrams that I've looked at appear to be that the triangulation stations are at least anywhere from six to 10 and sometimes 20 miles apart because they're trying to keep the geometry you know, strong. So they're building quadrilaterals and chains of triangulation like that. These are not one mile shots. These are pretty far shots. Well, through my experience, even in the dry climate here in Colorado, you get much further than a mile, mile and a half. It's almost, you, can, you can't hardly even see the target that you're looking at through heat waves, distortion, Humidity. Yeah, but you got to realize how they were doing it. What they use for targets that they could see at six and ten miles. You don't. You haven't heard of this. This is new to you. The triangulation. How they did it. No, I know that they did long shots, and even back in the day, they used to attach telescopes to some of their theodolites. Yeah, I mean, they, they built these tall towers, and uh, the, the, you know, the uh, thing that they were looking at were these lights at the tops of other tall towers. So they were way above the heat waves. Anyway, there's just another tab open now for uh, people that can research how triangulation was performed. And so let's see here, there is a picture of, I know one of these has a picture of them setting the disc below the tower. I'm just not seeing it. Yeah, the, here's the size of the telescope. That's their theodolite right there. Gotcha. Yeah, it's big. It's it's huge. Um, you can go see these too at, in, uh, at, in Corbin. They have a whole collection of all the uh, triangulation equipment that they were using back then. Now here's a picture of the arc of triangulation that was observed along the 39th parallel. Of course, you can get the whole triangulation diagram, which I have, of all the triangulation done. And, you know, then, then all these disks are being set, are set underneath of every one of these towers. So when you look at like say this one in Utah, this is the job I was showing you. This is where you're working. And, I, and I, that's the triangulation diagram I sent you, this one up here. Just not too far away is this one we were looking at last night. Now these are pretty long, these are much longer lines because of course you got mountains on either side of this um, salt bed, salt lake bed. Right. When I was out there, yeah, I could see some of those from 20, 30 miles away. So anyway, um, where do you want to, that's, I think that's all the tabs that I had open. I, I just wanted to kind of breeze through those and then uh, see where you want to take this. Okay. Well, one of my first deals is, have you looked into the world's record long distance for landscape photography? No. Are you talking about that? Are you talking about the shot up in the, it's in Europe somewhere? In France, yes. 238 miles? Yeah. Uh, actually, 257, 257 
by uh, measurement through Google Earth, but I think it was uh, like 275, but being conservative, 257 miles. Yeah, I put that in one of my videos. Put that in uh, the uh, Earth, in uh, Flat Earth Curvature Confusion. Did you see that one? No. Yeah, I make the point in there that uh, I'm not going to go to that right now, but I'll just bring this curvature chart up. Let's see this one here. This is the one that I, I used in my video. And I think he does a good job at uh, making the point. You know, he goes and he zooms in. You know, you've you've got this tangent line. This is the this is the line that you see in my photographs of Philadelphia, Empire State Building, whatever. You gotta establish this line. Without this line, you can't talk about drop of the curve, can you? You gotta have the horizontal line established, tangent. But he, he does a nice thing here. He zooms in, in miles. And uh, I include this in my curvature confusion. It's either that one or the one I did just before that. But the fact is that you can't see a thousand miles. There is no place on earth where we see a thousand miles. And I doubt there's anywhere where, I don't know if we can see 500 miles, even from Mount Everest. How far can you see from Mount Everest? Don't know, never been there. Yeah, well, I mean, there's pictures of it. Like you're talking about that picture taken, uh, where was it? In France, I believe. In France. Have you been, you know, you probably haven't been there either. I haven't. And the point is, is that that's like a world record photo. I should, I should like bring that up, pull it up. But, but I have been. And here, hopefully, real soon, I can go out and get pictures of it. Coming back last Thanksgiving from my sister and brother-in-law's house in Iowa, from 184 miles away, you can see the mountains here in Colorado. Clearly. Great. Now, why don't you take your theodolite, set it up, set the screen to 90, and see where that reference line is in relation to these mountains you see far away. But they, you shouldn't be able to see them. Well, you can see them, right? That's exactly right. So where okay. do you get the idea you shouldn't be able to see them? Right, with the mathematics of the shape of the earth, they should be way below the horizon and not visible at 184 miles. Is it possible you might misunderstand that? Perhaps, you are confusing the drop distance with the hidden distance. And that's something many flat earth believers do. Now this chart here is the one that you would use to make the statement that you are. So why don't you prove that? If that is that something you can go and do, set up your theodolite, aim it at the mountains, establish this horizontal reference, and see where that is in relation to the mountains you see off in the distance. I have a feeling that you'll take a picture that looks something like this. Well, I think you're overcomplicating the situation because it's absolute. At two, the the one in France at 260 miles should not be visible at all. Well, they were up there and they saw it. I mean, uh, how, how how do you make a statement like that that they shouldn't be able to see something that they can obviously see. And again, don't confuse the two things here. You're saying they shouldn't be able to see it. And I'm saying you're confusing the drop distance with, with the computation of the hidden distance. Two different things. We'll kick up the earth curvature calculator and let's throw in the numbers. Which one do you want to go to? Whichever one that uh, you prefer. I don't really use this Earth Curvature Calculator. I just do land surveying. I 
Uh, you mean like the the uh, Metabunk one? Yeah, you could use that one. I might want you to go ahead and let's share your screen and let you prove that. I'm saying you're gonna you're gonna get two values. One is gonna talk about the drop. But before we even go to that, would you agree that you're gonna see values talking about the drop distance? And you're gonna see values talking about the hidden amount below the horizon. Right? Right. Okay. Now this one here doesn't show the hidden distance, it's just the drop of the curve. That's all this one's talking about. Right. And that even that well, I guess you're at the top of the ball, so you would be looking out that way on a 90. Well, no matter where you are, I don't, you know, it doesn't matter the top <laughs> the top of the ball. <laughs> we did this last night. You 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 keep thinking like this is down. And I asked you last night, I said, well, point down. You know, down is down no matter where you are. That's down. Right? Oh, I missed that. I was trying to kick up the earth curvature calculator. Oh, I was saying that you're saying this is the top of the ball on this sketch. Yeah. But, you know, the, you're up and down where you are in your room is not this. This is not... This is up on the sketch. This is down on the sketch. Okay. But that is not up and down where you are. Down is at your feet and up is above your head. Right? Yes. Okay. So when you talk about these long distances and you've, you've cited the one that's considered to be the land record, What'd you say it was? 270 miles? 257. All right. Let's let's say there's a place you can see 300 miles. We haven't found it yet. But there's a place you could see 300 miles. What? Why do you have to go find such a unique location to see so far? If the earth is flat, every time you come to the top of a hill, why, why don't you see hundreds of miles everywhere all the time why do you have to go searching for such a unique spot to to to, to not even see 300 miles they only saw 250 some miles well i don't think it's unique like i said i can see the mountains 184 mile in nebraska okay but 184 is not 250 so you could see 184 miles away great but where is you, you, I want you to establish that horizontal reference just the way I've done. You know, I'm not near mountains of those sizes. So this is, I'm working with what I have around me, uh, you know, and this is an important component that keeps getting left out of all these discussions about how far you can see. And so as a surveyor, I think you should be able to bring this into the discussion. Well, the, I'm going off of what I've been told the shape of the earth is. And if the shape of the earth is what we've been told, then even photographing something 40 miles off into the distance over water should not be possible. If it's something that's only 30, 40 feet tall and it's been uh, done time and again. So that's why I question the math that has been done to explain the shape of the earth. Well, look at this picture, Chris, without any math involved, except for uh, all I'm telling people is how far away it is. I'm only telling them what the elevation of my crosshair is. That's, you know, this is the only math involved here. I'm not making any assumptions about the shape of the earth, the radius of it, nothing. Just saying, this is how this is how high up that crosshair is. This is how far away it is. We can do 
any research you want on the heights of the buildings in Philadelphia. This just happens to be the Comcast building. I personally measured, I measured the building myself doing triangulation and determined the elevation of the cor of the uh, corners. Okay. Do you, do you uh, agree with this ability, our ability to do that or not? Am I, am I valid here? Maybe I should take a whole different, I think I'm coming at you trying to convince you, but maybe I should step back and say, okay, perhaps, perhaps I'm misinformed here. And all this surveying I've been doing all my whole life, there's something wrong with it. It's flawed in some way. Chris, please help me find out what's wrong with me thinking I have determined the elevation of the top of that building. Do you find that, do you agree that I did that or is there a problem with what I did there? No, I believe, and I've done try, I do that uh, quite a bit. We have to get the heights of cell towers all the time. Okay, so we're in agreement that I can establish a position here at the river and triangulate to the corners. I hope this is, is, is this visible? Can you see it okay? Yes. So we, you and me agree right now that this is a valid surveying technique called triangulation. And I've established the elevations of the corners of that Comcast building. We're in agreement on that? Yes. Okay. And then that's, that's kind of up close. Maybe, you know, I'm not gonna open Google Earth right now to measure that, but it's, uh, it's a whole lot closer than 32 miles. Let me tell you that. Here's just a picture of the building and my crosshair on it. And like I said, it's, it's a lot, it looks a whole lot the way I just did the Marriott building in uh, Louisiana. Um, so then I go out here into South Jersey and climb this fire tower. And by the way, below this fire tower down here is a geodetic marker. It's called, uh, Apple Pie Hill. Um, I was going to open a tab uh, on just the fire towers themselves. It's an interesting process they go through to spot fires uh, out here. Let me let me see if I could find that. New Jersey Forest Service. So I don't know if other states have these, but uh, New Jersey has these fire towers that are situated. I wonder if there's like a map or something. You know, they're situated, uh, they're spaced basically far enough apart that some of the towers can see each other. And some of them are so far apart, they can't see each other. Here's a, I guess here's the whole history of... Uh, of how they went about doing all this. The, uh, oh, this is pretty cool. All right, here's another uh, link for people that are following this story. You can come and see this for yourselves and, you know, dig into this. But what happens is at, at these towers, you know, there's Apple Pie Hill. <laughs> I picked it. A fire ranger sits up in here when he's on duty, when the when the risk for fire is higher. And up in this building, this little hut is an alidade. It's just a tube with a compass on it. And it's plotted right on top of the topographic maps surrounding this area. And whenever they see a fire or a smoke, they call it, they see a smoke, the different towers triangulate and, and hone in on where that fire is so they can call the uh, forest service, you know, the firefighters to that, to that location using the latitude and longitude from the topographic maps. And every one of these fire towers has a geodetic monument down here. And that's how they were able to plot these towers on the, uh, on the maps. A lot like what you were talking about, the uh, cell tower surveys you do, and you give them the latitudes and longitudes 
those engineers plot those on their mapping software. I mean, in the old days, they would do it by hand on, on maps. Now they just do it digitally in a mapping software. So they can calculate the coverage and to make sure that they're getting the right overlap to uh, increase and improve cellular service. That's what that's about. But um, so anyway, I was talking about this. So, so after I located the Comcast building, I'm over here now, 30 some miles away. And uh, this is not the theodolite. This is just the, the uh, auto level. And its main function, all it, all it does is establish this horizontal reference. All right, so back to the story here. You're okay with me locating the Comcast building and determining the elevations of the corners. But now I'm 32 miles away. I set up the, the, the uh, instrument up here at elevation 256. And that's what that line represents, elevation 256. And so what is your explanation for that? Or earlier, earlier you had said it's perspective, but we've already been through the fact that perspective isn't something that actually harms or f creates any problem for surveying measurements since that's how we locate everything. That's how we measure the heights of mountains. That's how we, we triangulate the locations of mountains and their and determine their elevations. And uh, like I showed you, the uh, Empire State Building is a triangulation station. It was located and intersected from many, many, many miles away. So perspective can't be, uh, can't really be, uh, it doesn't come into play here, right? And did you uh, take into consideration refraction? This is, there's no calculation here whatsoever. You're, you're so just, you're, what you, in other words, what you see is, this is nothing but a photograph through the telescope. No doubt there's some refraction involved here. So if we could calculate the refraction, what, what would it do right now to this picture? Well, refraction bends light down. And how much? All depends on the medium between you and what you're looking at, the humidity, evaporation. Okay, so what we're doing now is uh, we're setting aside perspective, magnification and distortion and, and mirroring, and we're going with refraction now. And Well, I think that's how it's explained by most people. Refraction to me is the same thing as distortion, humidity, and everything between. Okay, so at. refraction is a distortion of sorts, but we have set aside perspective and we have set aside what was the other one? Magnification. I still um, believe that has a lot to do with it. Okay. Can you explain how it affects this photograph, but not this one? Well, let me look into the numbers and crunch the numbers, and then I'll have to get back with you on that. Uh, on the fly, I'm not going to. Oh, yeah. No, I'm not asking you for a number right now. I'm just talking in generalities. We could we could certainly explore a lot of different examples of, you know, triangulation to various objects and so forth and, you know, look at the raw data and so forth. But in this case, I'm just saying in general, if, if I can make these measurements and determine the elevation and so forth of the building, boom, that's done. Now I come over here further away and it, and it looks like this. So what's, what is, what's the explanation that elevation 256 appears to be at the top of a, a, a thousand foot tall building? Well, let's get back to, uh, my the what i've been trying to say is that we can see things much further away i kicked up the earth curvature calculator for that long distance 
uh, landscape shot. Yeah, I'm coming over to you. And I went to Metabunk. Yeah, I can't figure out how to get the screen share up. Oh, over here. Here, what I'll do is I could stop, right? And what you'll do is come right here where it says screen share. You see that? Yeah, I got you now. And then, okay, so I'll stop and you go. I'm trying to get it. It says I'm sharing. You are. If you just slide your Hangout screen out of the way now, I can see the Metabunk calculator thing behind you. Okay. Behind you. There you go. It's all good. Clear. Right. Now, I don't know the exact elevation. Of which? Of which he took that picture. I'd have to look that up. But you mean the one, the France one? Yes. Well, they're way up in the mountains. So I guess we'll do the one. I think you, you, you could right now Google it. Just look up, uh, you know, say world land record photography, something or other. You'll find that website. You'll see the little story that they tell and maybe they mention it, but they are mountain climbing. They are up in the mountains looking at another mountain far, far away. So then I'll kick up uh, my observation at 184 miles at standing on the ground. And we have a uh, hidden 4.14 uh, 4 miles. So there's no way I should be able right. to. Wait, let me, let me follow you. So now, this is not that land record site. This is the 184 right. miles away to some mountains that are how tall? What are the tallness of these mountains? 11,000 to 12,000 feet. And you don't think you should be able to see them? You shouldn't with 4.14 miles of uh, curvature between me and what I'm looking at. Does this calculator allow for the height of the thing that you're looking at? Yeah, it's up at the top. Oh, you mean the height of what I'm looking at? Yeah. Well, n no, this just calculates the hidden, the drop or the bulge between you and what you're trying to uh, view. Now, you've just, the horizon. You just mixed up several things. The drop is measured down from the surface level. Right. And then you have the bulge between you and the drop. Yeah, but your eye isn't below the bulge. Your eye is, you're at six feet, right? You said you're at six? Yeah. Hang on one second. It's just a reminder I got kicking up. Uh, let's see here. Oh, someone actually texted me, and I appreciate that, Jared. The uh, pick taken from... Uh, let me see if I can pronounce that. Here, here's the information. Fin, fin trellis. It's a, it's at 440 kilometers. Okay, this is all in kilo, This is in metric. It was taken before sunrise. And the elevation for the observer, he the observer was nearly uh, three kilometers in the, uh, up. You know, they were at elevation 2.8. So, yeah, of course, the higher you go, the further you could see, which is, I think, pretty obvious. Um, now, in this case, this example you're using, though, 184 miles away, and you said you're at six, makes sense. The green, the uh, green line is the thing, and that's what's visible, whatever it happens to be. So you could still see it. You could see that green from your eye level. See it? See that green thing sticking yeah. on? Yeah. That's horizon right here. Right. 
And you can't say anything about the drop unless you get your hand level. I would say take your hand level out there. <clears throat> or, you know, that's probably the easiest thing to do is get, get the hand level. They're only like 30 bucks to establish the uh, eye level line or that level, that surface, that level surface line. That's the only way you can say anything about the drop distance. And the drop distance is completely different than the hidden amount, which is pretty obvious on this little chart, right? Yes. On this little diagram. So, yeah, I always, you know, every time, and believe me, I've come across these all the time, people showing videos or pictures of things way far off in the distance. There's, there's so many of them that show up in the flat earth memes uh, of islands off in the distance fr from San Diego. Have you ever seen some of those? I've seen quite a few of them, yeah. Yeah, and, and the thing I do every time is uh, I go get the triangulation diagram for that location just to make people aware that, hey, in case you didn't know it, this is how that island was located. And surveyors went there and measured it, you see, and that's how we know the elevation of the mountain. And it was done using triangulation. So how... That's the thing I'm struggling with with you right now, Chris, is with the decades of experience you have, how do you pull these two things together that, hey, we have topographic maps, the maps show where these mountains are, that's how you know how high they are, and it was done by surveying, and then you say, we shouldn't be able to see that but you know they saw it when they surveyed it. Which should make anybody that's in surveying question the shape of the earth that we've been told. Because some of this stuff, if you use the mathematics that we've been given to calculate the shape of the earth again, there's things that we see off in the distance that shouldn't be visible. Well, you're, you that should make people start to question what they've used to come up with the shape of the earth. That's where I'm coming from. All right. And you, you are repeating that and that's what you keep answering, but that, how can that be the same answer? to the question that I'm asking you now, which is that you, tell, tell you what, you know what I'll do for you right now? Uh, I really wanna see if we can, I wanna see how far we can go with this, Chris, because I wanna tell you something. I believe you are genuine and sincere. I am concerned that you are a surveyor, not a licensed surveyor, we have to make a distinction you do need to be careful of that, by the way. This isn't me warning you or this isn't me, you know, uh, all I'm saying is be careful in your use of the term surveyor because some states, and I don't know if the one you live in uh, writes it this way, but there are laws about how you use the term surveyor in, a, in, a, in uh, applying it to yourself. And yeah, you know, just want to make sure you're clear on that, and that people that you're speaking with understand, you know, that you aren't a, you're not a licensed surveyor. But I don't mean that in any disrespect whatsoever. I believe that you have a long career in surveying. You've shown me that, and I get it when I'm listening to you. What I have is what I struggle with is how, you, and I this is just a failing of my own to not be able to fully understand yet. It just hasn't clicked in my head yet that you have the amount of experience you have as a surveyor and you think the earth is flat. So if it's okay with you, I'm, I'm really, you know, interested in talking to you more. Like we've been going about an hour and 20 so far. You have what, we can go what, till about two, you said? Uh, about another 30, 40 minutes. Okay. And we may use that or, you know, we may 
choose to uh, to end. I don't know, but just wanted to keep an eye on, eye on the time. But uh, I think this is valuable. It's a valuable conversation. So, uh, so do you did you turn your screen share off? Yes, I did. Okay, I'll put mine back on in just a second. Let me just leave it leave it like it is. Well, no, I'll go ahead and share. I, I wanted to uh, get another map. All right. Do people see my screen now? Do you see it on your phone? No, I don't. No. Oh, it says here, it says that I'm sharing. Seeing it yet? Nope, not yet. What do you oh, see? Here it comes. Okay, maybe it's just a delay. All right, let's see what I can go to here. Um, where is that mountain range, by the way? The, the 184 miles away one that you were talking about? It's uh, just west of uh, Longmont. I mean, what state are we talking about? Colorado. Right. I don't know if I have anything from Colorado. Oh, Colorado. So this is the triangulation diagram for Colorado. I use these a lot for a couple of reasons. One is that this the, probably most people don't even know they exist because these things were done so long ago. Uh, I've been quoted as saying, hey, we use GPS for everything. And I chuckle <laughs> because the fact is that surveying today is that's how it is. Every surveyor has GPS. Chris could attest to this. We, we're we using the GPS units a lot for, for a lot of things. And we can survey pretty much anywhere with them. So I bring up these triangulation diagrams to give people some perspective, some background. Where did we get all of these topographic maps that we use daily? Uh, it, it came from this work done long ago by lots and lots of surveyors working really hard to do this. Now, I'm up in the northwest corner of the state. You, can you guide me maybe toward where uh, where this mountain range is that you're talking about? Oh, on your triangulation map? Yeah. Like I said, I'm, this is the northwest corner of the state. Oh, it's uh, just uh, north of uh, Denver. All right. Let's see if I know where Denver is on here. You recognizing any names? Any place names? Here's Luis Maria Baca. Is that a county? Custer. Is that a county? No. Uh, Fremont. Yeah, that's a county. Okay. There's Fremont. Where should I go from here? I believe it's in Larimer County. Yeah, but I, you got to kind of direct me. Uh, yeah, without any city names on there, it's hard to. Yeah, but just by county. Uh... Uh, I think you have to go further north. North, okay. Let's come up north. Here's uh, Clear Creek County, Jefferson County. Yeah, I got to go further north. North, okay. Oh, I'll bet Sisters is uh, the mountain peak. Do you see Sisters? Yeah, 213 on your uh, diagram there, just uh, right of Long's Peak. Take your cursor down about an inch. Oh, over to the left. Oh, okay. 
over here. Here's Hague. Just below that. Go down just below that. You see Long's Peak and Sisters. That Sisters Peak you can see from uh, Nebraska. Okay. And that's over this way. Straight. Yeah, straight to the east. Straight to the east over here. So is this is this the like the edge of the mountain range? Yeah, that's pretty much the foothills edge of the mountain range where they start. Now, one of the things I like to do is take these maps. This is just a PDF of a scanned piece of paper. But I like to take them and uh, assign the coordinate values at the corners. And then, uh, you know, bring it into my software. And then I also go and get the actual station information for for these points. I kind of moved away from where, where I should be. Sisters, here it is. So uh, I don't I don't see me doing it now because it's it's a little bit time consuming to do it. But what I will do is just go over to Google Earth and we can check this location out. How how what do you think about doing that? Oh now? Yeah, I can do that right now. So now I can just I can put in what's the name of that peak, Long something. Twin Sisters, or you could use Long Long's Peak. They're both pretty close together. All right, we'll find it that way. Long's Peak, Boulder County, Colorado. All right, so so what are we at the? This is like along the ridge here, and then the it tapers off into the lower land or the uh, plains. And out here in Nebraska, you're saying you could see that guy, right? Right. If you go uh, I-80 right up toward the corner. Up here? Right. Yeah, right up in there. Okay. So from here, straight shot, you could see that thing. Yes. And that was just where I first noticed it. When I get back, I'm going to see if I can even go further. I think you can go further, maybe from North Platte. But for now, we'll go with what I observed, which was about where the I-76, uh, I-80 split is at. And that's uh, right about there? Yeah, just over the border. Okay. Well, let's do two things. Let's get you... Well, you're not going to climb up here, so... <laughs> Let's do let's do something real quick here. Just uh, get some control. Get rid of that. Mount Meeker, here's a Long's Peak. Okay, so for everybody watching, I've just located some geodetic markers that are up here. I'll just pull one of these and let's see, Long's Peak, let's see what it says. <clears throat> what you have to realize is that somebody went up there and probably set up an old satellite. This is probably done back in the, let's see when they first set this. This was done in 1939 is the first station description. Okay. And it was established by classical geodetic methods. And that, that means it's, it was done by triangulation. And so we have a latitude, a longitude for that station. And a rough elevation. Uh, nobody leveled up there. They didn't take levels and run them up that mountain. That would be <laughs> arduous. It would not be an easy thing to do. So it was done by, by trigonometric leveling, as Chris was talking about earlier or yesterday. He's done that too, and I've used it. It's a very good way to determine the 
height of a remote point. So this is how we have the elevation of the mountain at, at that point. And it's going to be one of those disks that's been set up there. Now, so there's a cluster of them. There's a few of them here. Here's another one. So a lot of times, you know, one may be lost or whatever, and they go up and uh, they can't find it, so they'll set another one. So there's, uh, there is some control. Here's some vertical control. Down, you know, you notice that the vertical control is following a roadway, or it could be a river. Well, let's go over, and I'll send you that one, okay, Chris. Let's go over here where you saw that from. Somewhere around here. Yes, right in there, in between the in between that tat, the yeah, just outside of Julesburg, right there at the split, further to the east. Like somewhere right about here. Big Springs would be pretty close. All right. <clears throat> Let's do another search. Yeah, and like you said, if you get back over that way, you could maybe. Uh, See if you find some points over here. I always forget to turn on the search. There we go. All right, there's some control here, Chris, and uh, I could send you some of these. Uh, that's, let's see, there's a vertical. Now that's a municipal tank. You're not gonna go climbing that. That's, you know, back in the old days, they used anything they could see, like church spires, water tanks, radio towers, anything that was visible, they intersected and, and triangulated those because it helped them map a certain area. Right. That won't, that won't help you in this case, but let's see what we have here. Well, here's a some uh, section corners. <laughs> what do you think? You might see it from here. You can drive that, right? These roads go along these section lines. Uh, sometimes, sometimes the uh, farmers have them blocked off. Okay. It off. But if it's a rural roads. Uh, all right. So, but if it's not a private road, yeah, there you could probably. You might, yeah. You might be able to. Might be able to go recover that and find it. Not that you need to, but I, f I find it interesting that someone went through the effort to put these there. Now, this one looks like it has a history to it. First monumented, looks like back in maybe 76. And then uh, 78. And then you can see these these different history uh, reports for the different recoveries. And this is, of course, back when it had a NGVD 29 elevation on it. And then 88 was released, so it has a new elevation on it. Oh, there's a photograph of it. Yeah, I think, though, like I said, given the shape of the earth that we've been told, that observation that I'm making, we shouldn't be able to make that observation. Well, that's what you, that's what you need to find out for sure, because I'm telling you now that you are, oh, cool. well, that is cool. That's a cool mark to go see, don't you think? Yeah, that's a pretty nice one. That's, that's pretty neat. That's elaborate. <laughs> Uh, because because it's a section corner, I guess. Here's a picture of the disc right on top. 1933. So it does have an old, old, old history to it. Yeah, I mean that's that's what you believe right now. But I believe uh, that it has it's based upon some misunderstandings you have that 
you should you should look into further. Again, look at what happened. This is not a joke. You know, somebody didn't draw these sitting in a room somewhere going, hey, this will be funny. Let's draw all these lines on a map. There's field notes involved. I mean, you do realize, you, let me ask you that. Uh, I, I, go, I go a little hog wild here. Let me just ask you a question. Do you think this triangulation took place? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and some of those distances that you're showing should question the what we've been told the shape of the earth is. All right, maybe I'm starting to hear you. Okay, so what you're saying is, you do believe this surveying took place, and uh, wow. Well, yeah, because I go to these marks, to quite a few of these marks all the time when I'm doing uh, cell tower surveys, uh, aerial surveys, uh, mapping of long areas like along highways. What's the longest highway job you've ever done? The longest highway job I've ever done was uh, 13 mile reconstruction when I worked for the highway department. Okay, that's um, and that's regular regular uh, surveying I've done I think 20 or 25 miles for the uh, new cell network in Denver. So kind of on the small side, nothing like these. Look at that line there. I mean, these are long pretty long lines. We could get we could get the station information for this one and this one and uh, you know compute the actual distance between those two marks. We could just go into Google Earth and string a you know make a measurement, boom. But you would see that some of these are much longer than the others. And the reason is is because the reason they are longer is because they can see them. Exactly. And that's what I'm trying to point out, that if you look at those distances and then take what we've been told the shape of the earth is, they should not be possible. Well, that, I know you keep repeating that, and I'm, I keep repeating that you're mistaken about that, and that's some investigating you'll need to do for yourself. And you can do it pretty easily even tomorrow. Like tomorrow, you could take your satellite and discover for yourself that the plumb lines are inclined to one another. Now, when you discover that, Chris, when you when you when that hits home, and you go, "Wow, if the Earth is flat, the plumb lines should be parallel." Let me find a picture of that. Oh, come on. I got a picture somewhere. I used this is my generic sketch that I use. It's it's you know it's sort of like the Metabunk, only my own limited ability concoction in uh, PowerPoint. If the Earth were flat, Chris, would you agree that these plumb lines should be parallel? Yes. Okay. Now, if you take your theatolite tomorrow, or this afternoon, or tomorrow, and and just you say you have a three-second uh, S5? You know, I was thinking about that last night. No, I believe it's a one-second gun. Oh, cool. Even better. Uh, do you have the uh, the target assemblies? Like, what do you use for targets? Do you have the, uh, the Trimble uh, Traverse Kit targets? Mm, no, I have a uh, hard 360-degree target, backside target, 360, just okay. Oh, that's the type you put on the range pole for doing topo. Uh, no, I have another one. Okay. Yeah, the one that I use uh, for doing topo is uh, uh, 360 degree also. Okay. But this one is just a, it's not electronic. It's just a fixed 360 degree uh, target. And will, will your S5, will it reach out and grab that? that 360 prism uh, at about a thousand feet, do you think? Yeah, but it'd probably grab it at a half mile or a mile. Oh, good. Well, you know why I'm keeping it short, Chris, is to eliminate the whole thing about refraction. Like if we say, yeah, you know what? The further you go, you're going to have refraction involved and there's no doubt about it. You will. So let's try to eliminate that from the, uh, from the test and say, we're going to minimize that to, 
to an inconsiderable amount. And that's why I'm suggesting about a thousand feet. Because at a thousand feet, you can see your target pretty well, pick good atmospheric conditions, afternoon is best, and set it up, you know, here, measure us, you know, just have it do some rounds and do like four or five, six rounds to your target. And then pop and swap, put the, put the theodolite here and put the target over here and uh, just measure back. Yeah, gotcha. I hope I hopefully plan on doing that. And, we're and then, but, but let me just finish this. So then, when you do that, the sum of those zenith angles on a flat Earth will be 180 degrees all the time, everywhere, right? Should be depending on, uh, 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 like I said, distortion between you and your target. Okay. But, well, you know, have any <clears throat> what's that hopefully at a thousand feet you won't have any well, that's what I'm, I'm suggesting that at a thousand i mean i've done this at miles so uh so yeah so let's try to reduce the refraction and so it becomes uh, uh not a consideration and then i'm saying on flat earth if you go north Let's pretend this is north and you go a thousand feet and measure this. You're going to find out that the sum of the, the zenith angles is greater than 180. And that is a direct measure of the theta angle on the curve chart. And go east, go west, go south. You're going to find the same thing. That's a... Uh, that's an easy test to do without a seven hour drive any place you can do it on your street you know okay before we run out of time i wanted to hit one of the subjects uh, that we talked about last night okay uh about uh did any of these tabs that we no, that I, no? let me see i'll screen share here okay let me go back and unshare Boop, boop. Got so much stuff open. Here we go. So I will stop and take it away. See if it comes up. I don't think it's come up. Try one more time. Oh, your screen? Is it something on, uh, you going to Google or something? No. It's a video. Oh. No, it still isn't coming up, is it? Well, I see yeah. something. Okay. This, uh, and I've done quite a few of these. I'll just play this video out. It's one that uh, one of my uh, coworkers did and sent to me. Seven satellites inside of a damn elevator. <laughs> I do that all the time. Okay, hang on, I'll play. And the reason why that is, is I've tested this. You can go into a building that does not have cell antennas on the roof, and you won't pick up any satellites. If you take one of these uh, GPS units into a building, that has cell antennas on the roof, you will pick up satellites inside and all over the building. Do me a favor. Is, is there a building near to where you live that you can do this test? You mean that has cell antennas or doesn't? That does, so that you can get GPS indoors the way you're showing us here. Oh, here you go. I, mean, I, I, I want to suggest something to you. If you have a place where you can do this, is this one of yours? Yes, this is one I did. Okay. Inside the building. Did you did you happen to push the position? Uh, did you get a capture of the position? Oh, the latitude, longitude. Yeah. 
No, I'm just showing, stating that, and I just showed that I'm standing inside That's of a building still, and still and getting and eight satellites. Yeah, I, I get that in my house all the time. Uh, sometimes I don't want to go outside if I'm just testing something. Uh, not sure where, you, you know, what is this proving that there aren't satellites, that they are cell tower antennas and stuff like that? Cell, cell tower triangulation. Yeah. So, yeah. so right. yeah. Okay, Chris, if you're satisfied with that, if that's good for you, there's nothing I can do to help you out. If you are going to just look at that and conclude that GPS comes from cell towers without further investigation, such as, and I asked you this last night, what signal, what are you telling me that these cell towers are broadcasting L1, L2, and L5, and that the Russians are in on it because you're using uh, GLONASS. And just let me get let me get a few thoughts out here about this test you've just shown us. Uh, I mean, come on, I'm, I'm gonna tell you right now, I could do the same thing and I get GPS signals indoors because it's possible to do it. But what I would tell you is that your position is crap. It isn't working. Uh, just because you're receiving some signals doesn't mean that you're getting good positional data. In fact, the position's probably a mile away. But you, sh you can test that for yourself. And if you can establish a position indoors, and I've done this test uh, a lot for cell companies, cell tower companies that wanted us to verify their ability to position themselves by cell phone technology. We ran geodetic positioning indoors, into parking garages, into malls, all kinds of buildings. And so we had actual truth points inside to compare to. And that's the only way you're going to find out if what you're saying is valid or not, you see. And well, to hang on, the only reason that you wouldn't get a good valid position or you won't be fixed inside of a building is because you have multipath going on. You have those signals that are bouncing off the walls and all over the place. When you're outside, you have a direct sight to that cell tower or multiple cell towers and radio towers, and that's why you get a good solid fixed position. Inside of the building, you have those signals bouncing off the walls and everywhere. Well, that is true, but you can create multipath scenarios outdoors as well. So uh, that that's not valid. And again, you've reached this conclusion because previous to this, you already thought the Earth is flat. Therefore, you've bought into the idea there aren't satellites. Therefore, GPS comes from cell towers and so forth. What no. you what no, you no, hang on, hang on. Let me let me let me. And what you have not done is a further investigation to find out if that's really true. So I've shown you a video I did. You should really look at it, and you should learn about Rhinex, and you should do this test right here and record the Rhinex data, and then parse it out and find out where the transmitters are. You say they're on buildings. I'm saying they're coming from satellites. You are saying they're coming from these towers because the towers have latitude and longitude on them. I'm saying they have latitude and longitude on them because they've been located and positioned. And I'm not going just on that. Like I was saying last night, I've been through quite a few walkthroughs with the engineer. Sure. Tell everybody what a walkthrough is. A walkthrough is where they go through the building to figure out what or how and where they're going to put their equipment to route their uh, cabling and stuff up to the roof to connect to cell towers. Okay. Uh, so you've been, around, you've been around these engineers. You've been with them when they're doing these site walks to, to do this uh, analysis of where to put their stuff. Have you ever t asked them if they're – if they are what GPS is being broadcast from? Yes. In fact, I asked that direct question because in one of the walkthroughs with one of the engineers, he was very panicked that they did not have a GPS 
signal coming in through fiber optics. And I ask him, what do you mean a GPS signal coming in through fiber optics? And he said, we pipe in or we bring in through fiber optics L1, L2 signal, and with the 2.4 gigahertz, I think, that cell phones are broadcasted on, they pair those signals together and broadcast all three through cell towers. So they do broadcast L1, L2 through cell towers. But the signal ori originates from satellites in space. Ask him that. You need to find this out, Chris, because you're drawing conclusions on very limited information and you're jumping to a conclusion because you think the Earth is flat and therefore there are no satellites. But the Rhinex data in that receiver tells you where the transmitters are and they aren't on buildings. The main purpose that cell carriers are using GPS for, one, is for timing. They use the, cl the clocks for synchronizing the communication network. That's the main thing they do with it. So, okay, we're up against uh, almost coming up to two. So some homework. I, I suggested some things for you to do. Is there anything you want me to do to further explore what you would say, I guess, is my bias or how I am, uh, you know, obviously, uh, you know, haven't bought into the flat earth. What would you have me do to, um, to help me see what you see? Well, I'd go back to the GPS and part of the conversation we were having last night. Uh, when I set up my GPS unit, it is uh, getting an ellipsoid height, which is a mathematical calculation. The geoid and the ellipsoid height is a mathematical construct, correct? Uh, well, the, the, back up a minute. Remember, GPS is working in a Cartesian system of coordinates, X, Y, and Z, Earth-centered, Earth-fixed coordinates. Right. That's, so we, that's, that's you know, you got, so you got to start with that. That is what, that's what's being broadcast in the ephemeris, in the navigation message. That is what the satellites themselves, you know, are positioning from ground stations and also between themselves, the GPS satellites, in addition to broadcasting their position, are determining their relative positions to each other. So they were actually processing the vectors between themselves. Uh, and, and so that, that all factors into this. So before you get the ellipsoid height, you have X, Y, Z uh, positioning. That is then, you, you, that's where the math comes into play is we can't really work with that. We need something that makes sense to us. So it, well, becomes, uh, it just, just let me step in a second. The X, Y, and Z is determined by what? How was the X, Y, and Z determined on a geodetic point that I set up my GPS on? Okay. So you realize there's a, there are three components. Let's go, let's go. Uh, I have the tab open. Are we still seeing your screen or mine? Oh, I'll stop sharing here. Yeah, I'll show you a picture of what we're talking about. Share. All right. Let me know if you see my screen uh, in the delay. You see that? I can see it on my screen, but on my phone, it hasn't come up yet. All right, give it a sec. Because what I'm getting at is if there is GPS satellites and they are as accurate as we have been told, then we should be able to get a exact latitude, longitude, and uh, our... Uh, Orthometric height without anything else. Without anything else, what? 
I, I didn't follow without, without running differential leveling, without using the uh, triangulation stations, we should be able to go out anywhere with our GPS units set up and determine latitude, longitude, and orthometric height to the hundredth of a foot anywhere on the globe. Put, okay, note that everyone. Chris, is, is this a request? This is what you want? Or you're just deciding that's how it needs, that's how it has to be? Well, from if the satellites in space know the that can triangulate to my base unit, then it should be able to give me all the X, Y, and Z on ground without anything other than, uh, without any geoid model, without any uh, mathematical ellipsoid height. Do you see my screen? No, I don't think you're sharing yet. Yeah, go on it. Says that I'm sharing. Well, what's really going on is we're establishing ground coordinates, latitude, longitude, and running differential leveling to these points. And then from that, we're determining the geoid model and ellipsoid heights. If we can get good ellipsoid heights, why can't we get good orthometric heights? Well, we, we can. I don't, uh, by the way, do you see my screen yet? Uh, yeah, it's showing now. All right, cool. Okay. All right, where to begin with this? Um, I'll, I'll say this, I hear what you're saying and you're, you know, you're posing that as a question and you're saying, why can't we as though, because we can't, that indicates some, some issue or problem and that then, then you take that and reach some conclusion that this is all what, made up and fabricated or? Like, in other words, you have an idea in your mind how it should work. And I will say, based on very, very limited, a very, very limited understanding of any of this. I mean, you're at a, like a, you're at the level of a guy who knows how to take the equipment, turn it on and do some things with it. That's where you are, Chris. You have no background. You have no knowledge of how this actually does work. So in... And so you're approaching it like this. I, I have this idea of how it should work. It doesn't seem to be working like that. Therefore, I will reach a conclusion that there's something wrong with it or it's not what they tell us it is because that's a, that's a repeated st statement. I will suggest to you, because we don't have the time, we were up to one minute of two. I would say, go back, delve in, actually learn how it really does work or or i'll phrase that for you on your for your behalf learn how they say it works learn what they say by the way this is all open source information you got to figure all the manufacturers out there who are competing to sell gps equipment of all kinds on construction equipment for surveyors for tracking ups trucks on these in these fleets you name it. All of these companies are working from the same open source specification documentation so that they can create their products and their software to compete. And so what I'm saying to you is you've got homework to do. You don't know how it actually, I keep saying how it actually works. I'll rephrase it. You aren't really sure of what they say, how it works. And you, so you've got to do some homework there to, to look at what they claim is it, it is doing. And then you have to find out how it's not doing that. And well, test you in the elevator and inside the building doesn't get it done. It's not, it's not a valid test because I've been in Texas where there is zero cell signal, none whatsoever. GPS works there. I've been overseas in remote areas where there's nothing. And this is, goes back to way before self, cell phones even. I've been in Peru, Venezuela, and other places. I've been in Asia. And I've been in remote areas that we didn't even have cell phones. 
and there were no towers of anything. Okay, no communications. GPS works. GPS works out in the ocean, right? There's no cell signal out there. So, give There's, yourself hang give on. a deeper it, background on what, how it is said to work, and see for sure if it is or isn't doing that. And like I told you, it's in the Rhinex file. All the all the information you want is right in that text file. You open it with a ASCII text reader. Good. I was going to say, I ask questions like this because I want to direct them toward it. And I do take a little bit of offense to you saying I don't understand how it works. I do understand how it works and how they say it does work. And what I'm saying is, is I can punch holes through all of that. Yeah, but I don't hear that you did in what you just said today. I, I feel that what you, what I heard you saying about the ellipsoid heights, orthometric heights, I think you're a little confused about those things. And I definitely think you're not, you're not aware of really uh, the claim. I'll, I'll call it the claim of how GPS works. And look, I'm, I'm saying we all have things to learn. I have things to learn. You have things to learn. I'm, I'm suggesting this is something you should learn more about before you jump to the conclusion that you have. And I did ask you, what do you want me to do to try to uh, better understand what you're seeing, uh, whether it's GPS or not, any any of these other, you know, all these other topics that we talked about. We never did talk about breaking down the section corners and these uh, state boundaries. I mean, how can you reconcile all this with flat earth? I don't get that. Well, the, the same thing there, I told you, when you go north, your lines do converge. Yeah, but they use the sun to do that. They use the solar compass to do that. That's how they stayed on. I mean, they did have a magnetic compass, like this instrument here. You know, they all have these old old transits have a magnetic compass, but they realized that they're coming across ore deposits and things that were pulling them offline, and they developed this thing, a little handy thing called the solar compass which made use of the sun's position at solar noon based upon tabulated information in the ephemeris that predicts where the sun is at that time. And that is using, as you would say, you know, the ball earth model to do that. And to me, that's evidence of how surveying works and how these lines were laid out. When you, you know, that's that's that was the point of this. But I guess the one thing, look at Lorand. And Lorand, they used that for long distance navigation before there was GPS. Correct. Next thing is look up when GPS first come to be. And then also look up and see when cell towers and the the consumer cell phones come to be. And I think once you look that up, you'll see that they both come to be at almost exact same time. Well, you know. Is that a coincidence? What else came to be? Uh, was the VCR out or DVDs at that time? I mean, you know, technology of all kinds has its, has its own uh, track of development. So you're pulling together these two things, cell phones and GPS. But GPS was working before cell phone towers. When did GPS come to be? The development starts in the early 70s, but you, you've, you've researched this, right? Yes, and cell phones started in 1973, they come to be. And we're, so they were using cell phones in what, like in the urban areas, right? They didn't have that, it wasn't, uh, spread all across the whole country. I bet you we could probably look up three or eight a map, uh, I'll show a map of the uh, cell cell network coverage and how it probably started in cities because that makes sense. You're gonna have more ability to put those towers up and get coverage and then you're gonna start to expand it. So I would say that I don't know this to be fact, I haven't looked it up, but you're saying in 1973 cell phones began 
and I'm saying it would be a limited usage in certain areas. And uh, GPS doesn't really start till 78. But before that was the, the Navy system called Transit. And that was a Doppler-based uh, navigation system using satellites. So that kind of like eliminates or, you know, undoes your tethering of cell phones with GPS because the transit system existed way before that. They had Doppler radar? No, no. Light. No, I'm saying the transit system made use of a Doppler technique in positioning. And before that, what did they use? Before uh, that Navy transit system, there may be a, there may have been another one that I'm not sure of, but before that, then it would have been uh, the BC four program. And the, the uh, Navy and uh, the military service used Loran for quite some time. Well, yeah, Loran has been around a long, long time and so has Shoran, but I believe is, and is it not possible that Lorand is just an expanded, expanded to cell towers and more ground-based triangulation points. Is it possible? I'm not saying that you believe that. All I'm asking is, is that possible? Well, I would say that you're asking a question that you have that you can find out the answer to. I already know the answer. I believe, yes, it is. Okay. But you haven't shown that in this in this uh, two hour hangout. Do you want to try? Do you want to like schedule another one for a later date, where you present that information of how you reached that conclusion? Because you you you've jumped to that conclusion on this hangout. I'd like to be convinced and shown that that's you know that that is true. Can, you know, would you like to do that at another time? Yeah, we'll set up another hangout. All right. So the next one will be uh, not. And I'm, I'm not saying when, but I mean the next one will be. We'll pick it up there because we'll, we could drop this one now, and you're going to show us how you know you're going to tie together Loran. Loran's an expansion of GPS, or Loran expands and becomes GPS. The Russians are in on it. That's the GLONASS. The Chinese are in on it. Uh, oh, I can definitely dig up the the proof that the Russians already have admitted that they use ground-based navigation for their GLONASS. I can look that documentation up. I'll put that in the next one. Uh, are you sure you're not confusing that with a ground augmentation? Because that exists, you know. There's an, uh, there are augmentation services to assist in urban areas where the GPS, actually we keep saying GPS, the whole system is called GNSS now, because it, embro it embro you know, encompasses all of these systems. And they've been working on this for decades on how to help mitigate the multipath that you encounter in these urban areas using ground-based augmentation signals that do broadcast comp uh, L1 and L2 frequencies. Why? Because then your GPS receiver can pick it up. So I think maybe you might be looking at that, possibly. Okay, well, we'll uh, look forward to the next hangout. All right, sir. Thank you. And uh, I guess I got to, oh, my God, I got so much open. I suck at doing this, don't I? <laughs> Where is what I wanted to see? I always like to just try to take a look, and I'm not going to see it here. I want to... Uh, See if anybody's watching first. Okay, here. Well, people are still there. Uh, hey, I don't want to hold you up. Uh, I might chat with these folks a little bit. Do you want to stay on, Chris, or uh, or or say yeah, something? Yeah, I've got to uh, go meet up with my sister. Okay, man. It's been good. I, I hope you didn't think we were getting at each other too much. I I get a little what revved up a little bit. I'm trying to stay calm. I wanna I do 
appreciate you talking about these things. And I think it's good for both of us. And I think it's good for anybody listening on. And, uh, you know, I take surveying very seriously. It is my profession. I don't know how you feel about that. Uh, it has a long tradition. Trad uh, surveying is, is, and I do maintain this to people, that nothing we have in this world would be here without the work of the surveyor, making the maps, the charts, and laying out the infrastructure that, that we uh, enjoy here. So surveying is a big deal to me. And uh, I want to reach you, Chris, because I think that, you know, obviously we're on opposite sides of the, uh, of the, of the uh, argument here. And, you know, I'm hoping that maybe at some point I might reach you to, to, uh, to realize that you are wrong, that the earth is not flat and that you would uh, dig deeper into your own profession to, to come to that conclusion. But that's me. I would say that I, I, I would respect that you would be doing the same for me. Help me see the importance of what you see and take your best shot at it. And let's keep it. Let's keep this uh, going here. Do you want to do that? Yeah. Awesome. All right, man. Good to go. Uh, be safe. Stay warm and uh, do good, man. Talk to you. Yeah. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks. Bye. Bye bye. All right, so I can stop sharing, I guess. Just talk a little bit. Uh, so let's see here. I'm going to look at the chat now. I haven't done this before. <clears throat> I mean, like this, like sticking sticking around here at the end. You guys all still here? I know there's a delay. Let me just say hello. I don't know if that showed up. So uh, I don't know. Do we have a mixture of people in here? Are there some flat earthers and and some uh, not flat earthers? I apologize to everyone. I, I kind of set this up and uh, I said it was going to be at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, that was my mistake. Chris had emailed me and said um, he, he indicated that it would have been uh, uh, noontime, my time. So uh, that's, that's why that happened. So... Um, that, you know, we'll try to, I'll try to get it right the next time. I'm glad that Chris wants to come back and, uh, you know, we'll keep up this discussion on GPS. <laughs> Thanks, Houseway. <laughs> I need forgiveness. <laughs> All right. This is, this is fun. I'm going to try to get better at doing this. I'm a little awkward with it. Uh, you know, please give me some slack there. So, uh, Time zones work differently on flat earth. Yeah. Jack principle. Thanks. Yeah. I forgot about that. <laughs> uh, well, I got to get going too. It's two 15. Got stuff to do. Sun is shining. Got to get going. And uh, that's it. I will say so long to everybody. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, I'll shut this down now. Till next time, everybody uh, be well. See ya.